Hi folks, so in this video we are looking at access controls and specifically we're looking at how we store our rules about who's allowed to do what. Um, and this video kind of sits in the, in the kind of series of videos around access controls um, and both looking at the theory side of things and also the practical implementation. And I guess this is where the two kind of meet up because um, we are we've got all these rules about who's allowed to do what that we're going to store somewhere and in order to actually create a system that works we need to store those rules and there's the way that we go about storing and reasoning about those rules um, often in practical systems are either via access control lists and capabilities and so I'm going to talk about the difference between those things and explain it. It's, um, it's pretty fundamental to understanding how the security on most modern system work, systems work. So, um, well, I mentioned this in one of the other videos, but the protection state of a system is basically in a snapshot of t in time, who's allowed to do what on this system? So what are all the files and resources that exist that are possible to access on this system? What is like every user um, or you know, depending on how you want to think about it, it's like all the users on the system or their programs or processes that they've started. What are they all allowed to do? So all the current snapshot in time, who's allowed to do what? And that current state of things is known as the protection state. And obviously it changes as you use a system. And there'll be transitions, like if you change the permissions on a file, for example, that's going to change the protection state. If a program starts, again, um, so, you know, you can use your imagination. There's lots of things that can happen that will result in protection state changes. Um, but we need to kind of have a way of um, thinking about the, the protection state. And so the simplified way of reasoning about access controls is to think about it in terms of an access control matrix. Um, and so it's the simplest way of kind of representing the protection state of a system. So Essentially, we, if we just create a huge table that shows every single subject and every object and what are the permitted types of access between them, then that's what an access control matrix is. So for example, we have a huge table and in the columns we've got a list of every, there's got a, a column for every single file or resource on our system. Um, so you can imagine a table that has tens of thousands of um, columns, for example, and every user or process um, that's on the system and what they're allowed to do. So you could have a list of all the users, uh, and then in this table we could have, okay, well, file one, in this example, user A is allowed to read and write file one and they own it, um, and file two, they can read and write, and file three, they can read, write, and own. User B um, can append to the first file, uh, they can read and write and they own that second file and they can read the third file and so on. So you can imagine just this massive table that describes all that information. And it's um, it's actually it's an abstract model. It's a way of sort of describing the association of rules and a way of kind of reasoning about who's allowed to do what on a system. But in reality, we also need an implementation. So we need to actually have some kind of tool or mechanism and um, some software that actually enforces these rules and defines exactly what each of these permissions mean. So, you know, what read permission means on, um, you know, on a different system might be interpreted to be something slightly different. You know, are you allowed to um, see a file name, for example, if you don't have read permission? Probably yes, but, you know, obviously when you design the system, those things are, are those questions are answered. Um, and you can use this massive table to kind of express any security policy. Um, you could have a, um, you know, any, any combination of permissions that you would be allowed. You could, you could represent the protection state this way, but it wouldn't necessarily be an effective way of defining or managing any of this information. So, for example, the groups that users are members of, um, you know, might not be represented very well this way. Um, 
and so you know it's a simplified kind of association of specific subjects and um, you know the objects that they can access. Um, but you know, really, this is for the theoretical analysis, and you wouldn't use it directly because it's just not practical. The amount of subjects and objects that you would have in a real life system. Um, would quickly mean that it would be a, just a terrible way of managing the security policy. So, um, you, you know, you, you wouldn't have a massive table that lists as a separate column every single file on a system because it would, you know, it would be a ridiculously sized, um, you know, set of permissions. So, the most common way of defining permissions, uh, you know, if we're not going to store it in a huge table, the most common actual solution that you will see in most operating systems is using access control lists, um, or ACL, or ACL, as you'll hear me call it. Um, so what you do with an ACL is that you actually attach the information about what's allowed to the objects in the system. So basically each file has some metadata attached to it that says who's allowed to do what to that file. And so we store the security information kind of like on the file itself or attach it to the file. Um, so that's kind of like how ACLs work. Um, so, so in that information that you would attach would include like the users, but also groups or, you know, whatever other way that you want to um, kind of create abstractions, but you know, you say those, these are the permissions for this resource. And so the, you know, if you remember with the access control matrix, this, this used table, well, an ACL is essentially storing a column of that information attached to the file. So in, on file two, in this example, you would attach a list that said, well, user A can read and write it, and user B can read, write, and own it. And you would basically take that information and attach it to file two. If there were blank cells in that huge big list, so they were users that aren't allowed any access to it, it wouldn't appear in, in the ACL for that file. So you just define positive um, you know, permissions, usually. Um, and so, yeah, you, you, you store the rules with the object. Um, so, you know, really. Um, to a huge extent, ACLs are the most common thing that you'll see in real life um, on a security system. On Even on Unix, those abbreviated ACLs, um, where you're just looking at users, groups, and other, that's really just a form of ACL. It's just a simplified form of ACL that's attached to a file, because that information is attached to the, well, the inode of the file. Um, and there, uh, but yeah, you'll see on Windows or Linux extended ACLs and things that there, you, ACLs is just the easiest way to manage it um, for the vast majority of the time. A lot of the times you, you might have um, mandatory access controls on top of that. They have a separate set of rules that might not, may not be defined within an ACL. It could be stored somewhere else. Um, so for example, SE Linux policy is stored somewhere else on the system, which gets loaded into the system. Um, and then the, um, yeah, but I mean, we'll talk about other. We'll talk about those things later. But um, you know, so there are other systems that might also be, um, you know, taking place on the system. Um, different security systems on your operating system, uh, but for the vast majority, ACLs are, are the way that you know the thing that's used most of the time. So capabilities is an alternative system that was proposed, um, and that it's a. It's a thing that exists where basically if you have the security information or the permission to access a file attached to the user rather than to the file, and so the information gets attached to the user, and when that um, access tries to happen, you rather than looking at the information attached to the file, you look at the information attached to the user and you say, do they have the correct capability to access this file? And it, you know it could be that the basically, it, you know, there's a few ways that this what this might look like. Um, the maybe the one way of visualizing it is you could have like basically that whole list of files that he is allowed to access, and you attach it to the user. Um, 
And you could probably already imagine why this isn't practical because the list of files is going to change, but then you can use abstractions like groups of files, for example. Um, or one example of, of a capability like thing is when you open a file and it will look at the ACLs on the file when you try and access it. But on a Unix or a Linux system, it looks at those files to decide whether you can open it at first. And then you've actually got the file handle open. And then each time subsequently you want to access that file, you can just use that file handle. And it doesn't check the permissions anymore. And in fact, I'm pretty sure that a, um, a process can pass a, a file handle to another process and you can access the file without needing to check the permissions. Um, but the, but the, the, that's the idea of capabilities. Um, and you keep the rules with the processes rather than on the files if you're talking about a pure capability system. Um, and so that represents a row on the access control matrix. And um, a lot of people argue that capabilities are actually not that practical, hence why you don't see them that much as a, as a thing that exists. There's a lot of similar concepts and similarly named things that are slightly different to what I'm talking about. So object capability is kind of a way of doing, um, is, a, is a way of kind of programming uh, like capability based systems using object oriented coding approaches. So that's slightly different, it's more closely related though. And you've got capabilities in Linux, which are not quite capabilities in this sense. Um, but we'll come back to capabilities in Linux later. Um, so Linux capabilities is instead a way of breaking up roots permissions into chunks or privileges that a process can hold. <clears throat> so it's kind of coarser grained than um, what we're talking about here, but it's closely related. So you know, capabilities require applications to be aware of them. Um, they, they're often considered hard to manage, whereas ACLs can be easily stored with files within the file system. Uh, and that's why it's the thing that's the most commonly used. So Windows and Unix, including Linux and Mac, all um, heavily use ACLs. Um, and you know, you'll see um, the term access control list used um, elsewhere in other like areas within security, but generally what it means is that you're, or what it should mean is that you're attaching the permissions um, and what's allowed to happen to the file or the, the object that's being accessed.